In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Lexio Divina for Theosis. I've heard some people say Lectio. My understanding is I've always called it Lexio. Lexio Divina for Theosis, God's word for your deification. While God is a big part of my life and, you know, my love of Jesus and the indwelling Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit moving in my life, what I realised was that I'd come to Scripture a little bit more academically lately, a little bit more theologically based. And what I thought then in this realisation of being in my head was that my heart was missing out on the way God speaks directly to me when I'm in his word. You know, when I just surrender into the word in Bible. And there he is, breaking into my busyness, breaking into my thought. And so I started the Lexio again. And um, we'll come to it very shortly. I'll show you the example that God gave me. But I thought, wow, this is something that I really want to share with people, those I love and those I care about, because it's so powerful. It's so beautiful. And at the same time, one of you was saying, come on, when are you going to teach some more? And I was saying, but I'm here, like I'm in the silence, I'm in the grace, I'm in my cave. I'm in this service that hasn't asked of me or required of me to teach. And I said, all right, that's my point on it. Lord, what's your point on it? If you've got faith for me, if you've got to work for me, then bring someone I love to my ears and let their faith drive it. Well, the very next day, of course, <laughs> one of you said, hey, why don't you teach? Why don't you run a wee group? And I said, okay, thank you, Father. And here we are, because I know that you're going to be blessed by it, because I know that because you're here, God in you is saying, huh, there's something in my life that I'm working with that I can be uplifted by through the word as we go through it. There's a change. There's a stagnation. There's a one who would push through. There's a healing. Something in you is moving is elevating, is growing. And by the power of the word, you're going to hear, know, feel, understand God's thought on that. And that's what this group is about. Login details you've got because you're here. Housekeeping, we're in the house of God. Basically, we're in church. We won't be bringing our copper into church <laughs> or our sandwich. <laughs> we're, we're in church for this time. So a bit about the language you would have read this. For me, my heavenly father, my beloved, his father, he's a he. It's how it is. It's how he came to me when I was little. It's how I understand Jesus understood God the Father. Your God might have a different pronoun, a different name, a different no-noun. <laughs> Entirely up to you, I'm working with the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Yes, it's recorded. These are the texts. I highly recommend The Ladder of Monks. It's just a short 
little book by Guigo. It's so delightful. He runs you through the Lexio Divina using the metaphor of eating a grape. It's delicious. We'll see a little bit more of Guigo in a minute. So one of the beautiful things about Lexio is we have time. We make time to be with God and to be with God's word. And we might want to record what happens for us during this time. And so if you've got a pen, if you've got paper, if you have a journal, have that near you. Because sometimes when God speaks to us, it can feel a little dreamlike. It can feel a little bit like, like I know that's the word of God. Or maybe that's the word of God. Okay, I'm just going to trust that's the word of God. And I'm going to remember that. And then an hour later, I'm thinking, mm, what was that word he said to me again? So please write it down. It's part of the process. Take your timing for it. You don't have to be in the moment with it and be writing at the same time. Take your time with it. And when you feel like it's time and energies have dropped off, then write it down. We're starting with the union of God. You all know that this has been on my heart for almost two decades now, at least 15 years. The union of God within us, with us. The incremental growth of us towards the will of God so that we can become divine. Do you need any other purpose in life than that? So on our matter of union with God, theosis, Theosis is our incremental spiritual growth towards union of will and energies with the triune God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God. Jesus Christ is the perfect gift God gives us in word and in deed to witness that divine union. Our deification, our becoming godlike, is revealed to us through Jesus' life and his example. As the Apostle Peter says of Christ's incarnation, Jesus' divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and goodness, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 to 4 and when we enter into the Lexio Divina, we stand on Jesus' promise that if we abide in his word, God will enable us to partake in the uncreated energies of the Trinity, which by grace gift us our divine nature. So what we see here is that through Jesus' word, through his promises, he delivers us to the Spirit of God in us, by which our incremental growth, our deification, by the power of the Holy Spirit, becomes a real thing. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Now, the Apostle Paul, when he's training one of his protégés in 1 Timothy, he says, 
how. How do we become deified? Well, we train in godliness. We train in godliness. There are many, many ways we can train in godliness. You will know that. You are doing that in your daily life, each one of you, else you wouldn't be here. Paul says, we train in godliness through the faith of the word, Jesus' word. So Jesus' promises, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 8, 31-32 If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. John chapter 15, verse 7 if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John fifteen ten. Through Lexio Divina, we come to abide in Jesus' word. Abide means we take to heart, we stay with and remain in God's word. Doing so, we experience Jesus' heart of hearts and come to intimately know Christ and God in us. This intimacy ultimately leads us to know ourselves better, to live the fruits of the Spirit, and to deliver God to others through our life as Jesus did and continues to do. As Jesus lived with the Father in him, so too we come to live in union with God in us. If you abide in my word, the truth will set you free. If you abide in me and my words, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Really take that in. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So you're here today because God in you is saying, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Abide in me, abide in my words, and this is what we're doing today. So, rather than entering the word cold, we are going to bridge into the energies that God has for us, and the word that he has for us through the Jesus prayer. I'm expecting that most of you know the Jesus Prayer. So the origins of it, they're a bit debatable. Some say that it came from the prayer of the mind in the 4th century. Others, that the words, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, were inscribed by a monk in a cave in a cell, a monk's cell in Egypt. Either way, the Jesus Prayer has been part of Oriental and Eastern monastic tradition for well over 1500 years. By abiding in Jesus through his name and the repetition of the Jesus Prayer, our minds empty of the world, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God,
have mercy on me. The word of God in this, the word of Jesus, delivers us to the Spirit of God within us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. So we're going to start praying this prayer now. Your whole attention is going to be on the Jesus prayer. Thank you, Father. As you move into a meditative space for the purposes of bridging into the Spirit of God and the Word, so this is going to be a practice. At the time that we do our Lexio, we'll do this again. But for now, the Jesus Prayer. And what we're going to do is we're going to breathe in and out. We're going to allow our body to slow down. We're going to allow our sensory experience to become interior and by the grace of God we're going to feel that shift in our consciousness that de delivers us to the Father to the Spirit of God in us now you can say it out loud or internally, but when you say it out loud, breathing in and breathing out is a little bit more difficult. So Jesus, we ask right now, bless us with your word and your prayer. Have mercy on us as we pray you, that you might deliver us to the Spirit of God in us. As you breathe in, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and you breathe out, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Have mercy on me. And have that sense of Jesus within you. Have mercy on me. And mercy doesn't just mean justice or pity or healing. It means attend to me, come to me. Bring your grace upon me. Deliver me to the Father, to the Spirit of God in me, Lord Jesus Christ. Son of God, have mercy on
And you can notice the blessing already, the shift, the momentum that you're drawn into, the energies of spirit. Thank you, Lord. So hands up who noticed the shift within them. As Jesus came forward, the blessing of that prayer that takes us out of ourselves into him and into the indwelling spirit. Thank you. Lexio Divina. Lexio Divina in Latin means divine reading or spiritual or sacred reading. It was originally formulated by St. Benedict in the 6th century as abbot of the Monte Cassino Monastery in Nursia, Italy. Benedict created a monastic rule for his monks. The rule organized the monastic day into work, prayer, and contemplation. In point 48 of the rule, St. Benedict writes, The brethren ought to be occupied at fixed seasons with manual work, and again at fixed seasons, with spiritual reading. A significant portion of a monk's day and the liturgical calendar was given to this spiritual reading. So Benedict, St. Benedict, is the originator of Lexio Divina. He noticed that his monks were a little bit idle, a little bit unruly, what do I do with them? Let's organize them. Let's create a rule. Admittedly, there wasn't a great reception to his rule initially. In fact, the monks did try to poison him. But aside from that, he came out with this wonderful exercise that is spiritual reading of scripture and associated text. The wonder of this is that Alexio Divina, spiritual reading, while we're applying it to the Bible and to Jesus' word by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do this form of spiritual reading with other texts. Now, as the seasons went on, and Benedict had his monks start to read spiritually. What he noticed was a great change in them. Suddenly their unruly behavior became quietened. The conflicts in the monastery itself eased. The ways that they interacted with each other became more compassionate, more polite, more understanding. No one was poisoning him or wanting him dead anymore. A great bonus, thank you, Lord. So he realized the great blessing of the spiritual reading, and it really did become a third of their year. It was compulsory. So what is spiritual reading St. Benedict tells us in his prologue to the rule, Hearken continually within thine heart, giving attentive ear to the precepts of your master. Understand with willing mind and effectually fulfill your holy father's admonition. Spiritual reading then is listening with our heart to God's word 
as we willingly receive and understand the word, then carry out God's direction. In this manner we learn what is God's will, and over time we come to a symbiotic relationship whereby our will is united to God's will. This union transforms our being. We shed layers of worldly limitation, becoming increasingly free, spiritually true and divinely human. Spiritual reading is a transformative process by which we are taken incrementally into the presence of God who then speaks into our lives and asks us, invites us into God's will for our life. Now here's where we come to Guigo. Guigo was a 12th century Carthusian monk who became prior of the Grand Chartreuse Monastery in the southeast mountains of France. In his book, The Ladder of Monks, so now we're talking centuries later, he discovers in himself a structure for Lexio Divina. So, so far, it's just been unstructured. There's been no framework for it. We've entered the word. If God speaks to us, praise God. But we know that the word has been transformative in monks in monastic life. Now, Guigo, he formulates what's happening in him and his awareness brought him to these four aspects of the Lexia. Reading, meditation, prayer, contemplation. In reality, it doesn't always go one after the other as you come to it as you'll find later on in this time that we have together. Sometimes it's in and out, you're flowing back and forth between the reading, the contemplating, the reflecting. So let's start with reading. Reading is the attentive study of Holy Scripture by the applied mind. In other words, we're focusing on the Word, we're reading it. And in fact, we're reading it to the point where we really embody it. We're really embracing it. Because you'll know yourself when you're reading any text, probably you can put yourself back to the introductory email that I sent. <clears throat> you'll have been reading and then you'll have gone, hmm, what did she say? I missed that whole section, you know. I was reading but I missed it. And we do that so often. So in Alexia we read through the context, through the words, through the energies. So we're reading with our full self. And then we meditate. We reflect. This is a, as Guigo says, a careful investigation of the hidden truth. What's happening here in these words? Who's saying this? What does that mean for my life? And then we pray. We invite God into the space. Hmm. Prayer, the elevation of the heart to God. So that it separates us from the world. So that we can do good. So we're coming out of our head in reading and meditating, reflecting. And we're moving into our heart. And then contemplation, the elevation of the soul in God, where it savors the joys of eternity. These are Guigo's words. So this is the process of the Lexio. At the start of the scripture, we meditate, we pray for blessing on our time, of course. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blessing that you're praying upon us as we pray upon you, to calm the mind, to 
quieten the body, quieten the mind while opening our heart. And we're trusting that the passage that we read is good for us. Now that's a big thing. We're trusting that it is good for us. So before any of this comes to be, I'm praying. I'm praying, Lord, these beautiful souls are coming to sit with you in this time. What do you have for them? And I'm listening. And based on God's return to me, I'm choosing the passage and you can be assured that that passage is for you and that it is for good in your life. So it's one thing to be sitting on the other side of the screen so far away from me but actually so close to God in you. So here I am speaking these words that sound quite formulaic, but actually you're here for and with God. I just happen to be the person speaking you through the process of coming closer in spirit. So it's really valuable to know that this time isn't about being here with me. It's about being here with God. And then we meditate. We read the passage again. And I'm going to run you through it as we come to our lexium. And so I want to share with you a wee story. Prior Rob and I, had decided, let's make a pilgrimage. Let's do it. We have to go to Australia soon for a wedding. Let's go to Israel. And we prayed on it, and we got the green light for Israel. We didn't get any timing on Israel, but we got the green light. Something didn't quite feel right in the green light. And so I was praying on the timing of Israel. Father, what do we do about the timing? Let's go to the Word. Let's meet the Word. What is the Word saying about Israel? And so, as God does, he gave me the word, Luke 7, 9. I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Luke 7, 9. You can count how many times Israel's mentioned in the Bible. I'm praying, Father, are we going to Israel at Easter? Really? Is that your word on us? I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. So we're meditating on that word. I meditate and I reflect on the passage. I notice the context. Jesus is talking to a centurion. The centurion is asking, my slave, he's unwell. Will you come and heal him? Will you do that for me? I know you, Jesus. I know that you can do this. I know it. The centurion says, yes. Like you, I can tell people to come and go. I can tell them to do things, they're going to do it. I know if you say, 
my slave is healed, he's healed. I know that. Jesus says, hmm, I tell you, not even in Israel have I seen or found such faith. So as we meditate, we're looking at the context. I'm looking at the context. And my brain is going, I tell you, Jesus is telling me. What he's telling me is, of all the scriptures he could have given me, he gives me one with the word Israel in it. <laughs> so I'm noticing that. I'm noticing the context. But not even in Israel have I found such faith. And the context, Jesus is talking not to a Jewish person, He's talking for a Roman centurion. A Roman centurion is send out his servants with word. So I'm taking all of this into consideration. I'm taking the context of my life, which is I'm planning a trip to Israel. So obviously God is talking to me here. I'm marrying the two. I cannot ignore that. What is God highlighting for me about my life and how I might need to respond? It's obvious that it relates to my prayer about Israel, I know that. How do I respond? And this is where we start to notice what's happening in us. What's the emotion coming up? What are we feeling? We don't push them aside. Because I tell you, it took me, I don't know, it must have taken me five readings longer to notice the emotion that was coming up. And then I noticed it. And then I found it. In the silence that follows, you might write down what the emotion was. I didn't really have to write it down at the time. It was very, very obvious. The emotion for me was fear. I was afraid of going at Easter. I'm lucky to see one person in a day, the prior. It's a very, very still space. At Easter in Israel, Tens and tens and tens of thousands of people. It's also Ramadan. It's also Passover. So the three great religions are having their celebration at this time. Do I really want to go to Israel at Easter? This is what I'm having to ask. And I'm noticing the prayer. And I'm noticing my fear. And the beautiful thing about noticing the emotion is that we then hand that over to God. Lord, take this fear and make of it what you will. And now it's no longer an obstacle. I see it for what it is. I see my reservation for what it is. And now I let that go because I'm back into trust, I'm back into the word. I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And then I pray, God, what is it that you have for me right now in this phrase? And here's where we open our heart. Here's where we listen. Here's where our reflection, our meditation, becomes listening. And we're going to find that our voice is going to come in and out, in and out. Notice it, let it go. Notice it, let it go. Whatever emotion comes up, hand it over to Jesus. Hand it over to God. Notice it. Move on. 
So we're emptying ourselves just as Jesus did and does for us. And then we're contemplating. We've called God into our desire. We've called with humility. And suddenly, a revelation, a word, a thought comes. And it's not our thought. It's not our word. It's not us. But God in us, giving us that word, giving us that thought. And so as I came into contemplation, for I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. My God said, not yet. So I had gone through the fear, gone through the doubt. I'd read the scripture as I was milling it over again. I tell you, not even in it, not yet. Thank you, Father. And when I brought that to prior Prioral, we came in at the same time. Let's talk about Israel. I don't think we're to go yet. i like, that's what my father says. We're not going yet. Hallelujah. We're both praying. We both entered into the word. God spoke. This is what will happen for you as you enter the word. We read, we meditate, we reflect, we pray, we ask, we contemplate, and then we have to act. We have to change. So we cancelled our accommodation booking. We made new plans. You know, that's the action. So many times, I mean, really, think about it now. Have you had the word of God and gone, mm, nah, not this time? <laughs> Yes, I understand, but I'm not really going to do that. Or actually, I think I'll do it my way. I mean, it's very easy to do that. Because God will call us often to stretch us, to move us, to elevate us, to increase us. And as a human being, we're very comfortable with familiarity. Not you who are here, of course, because you've made so many changes in your life that you're aware that to step into God's word is more favorable than your own direction. So one of the mistakes is getting a bit too heady with the Bible, with the scripture. It's too much. It's too... Um, literal. And I made that mistake right at the beginning. Huh. Not even in all of Israel. <laughs> what could he be saying here? You know, I delved into, okay, so the centurions, maybe Italian, he's got, you know, I was really going into all the nitty gritty of it until I got this dog and move into, ah, what's that little thing there? That's an emotion, that's fear. Okay. So one thing is, and I did this three times before I let it in, was I cut off fear. Just cut it off. Ah, you don't belong here. Come on, I'm with God. <laughs> I'm, I'm meditating on the word here. That fear doesn't belong. The emotion is going to be part of the process. Please allow it. Please notice it. Please let it have a voice in your lexio. Because it will be part of the revelation process, part of God's word, part of God's movement in you. The second one, the third one, is to the mistake that we might make or the obstacle we might encounter 
is to ignore our life context. Well, that's good for someone else. Yeah, that might apply for someone else. I know someone that definitely applies to, has nothing at all to do with my life. I can tell you, if you're sitting with the word and that word has been given to you, then there's some little gem in there for you. It might not be the huge leap of transformation that another person has, but it will be a blessing, whatever it is. So being mindful of the context, yes, of the biblical passage, but also of your own life. Hurrying, which I'm trying not to do right now. Lexio is God's timing, out with time and space, <laughs> entering into our time-restricted space. This is what we want to do. We want to hand over our time to God. Between the beginning of my prayer and entering Lexio and God giving me the word and us changing our plans, was six days. It wasn't one hour. It was six days. And in those six days, I held the Lexio in me. Not even in all of Israel have I found such faith. And I let it work me. And I let God rise up in me. So six days, no time limit for the way that God works in us through this amazing process, shaming ourselves. Oh no, I shouldn't be feeling fear. I'm a godly woman in my godly paradise. Why would I feel fear? Shame, shame. Of course, we're all human. We have emotions. The feelings will rise and fall. Please let them, let us be kind to ourselves. Let us know that it's also a gentle process. That while some people might have very clear booming God voice, others might come with a knowing Others might have a thought or a flash of a picture that God speaks to us in different ways. Our doubting and our skepticism. Now I know a lot of you very, very well. <laughs> Did I really hear this word or this phrase? Am I making it up? Am I imagining that voice? Was it my own thought? How do I really know it was God? So if doubt and skepticism come in during Lexio, it's going to cut God's word off if we allow it. If we allow those doubts and those thoughts can't possibly be God, that was my own, that I'm sure that was me, that was my imagination. God is cut off immediately. It's a little bit like, it's a little bit like me loving on you here and you suddenly taking your microphone off and going, I had pizza today. The what? What? Where's the relevance in that? Come on, stay with it. Stay with it. God is speaking to you. You know, in Compline at night, we have a nine o'clock Compline, and then we go into silence. And Compline lasts for about 15 minutes. It's probably my favourite divine office of the day apart from the Holy Communion. It's dark. We have a single candle. 
and we're praying and giving thanks for the blessing on the day. And at the moment, there's a short reading on Matthew the poor. And this is what he says. O oh Lord, this Bible was written for me. It changed prior Rob's and my perspective like that. Over 2,000 years ago, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, wrote a book for you, for me. He knew every question that you'd ever have, every heartache, every joy, every prayer. And in that book, he wrote to you. This is how I'm asking you to approach the word. It's a love letter. That's what it is. It's a love letter. My darling, read this, read me, and I'll speak with you. I'll bring you into my presence and I'll speak with you. If there's one thing I would beg of you, is when you approach the word, do it in this manner, that there is another, that there is God with a word for you, specifically for you, out of time and space, into time and space, written for you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Amen.